Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. So far we have looked into one dimensional partial differential equations through both the theoretical analysis and using MATLAB. And today we are going to explore a little bit further. We are going to shift from one dimensional coordinates to two dimensional systems. So that such that the function or the variable would depend on x and y for instance. These could also be the equations which has time and space as the two coordinates. But for now, we would be restricting ourselves to steady state problems so that the time variable is not there. Of course, we will be moving on further where we would be considering both the time and space. But for now, we would not talk about the unsteady flow problems. So let's talk about how we would be discretizing such a system where it shows where the function that we want to investigate, it shows the variation in both the x and y direction. So we'll start with what is called as a 2D diffusion equation. This equation, although it could be written both as unsteady and a steady system, but for now we'll talk about only the steady, type, steady case. So if I go into the notes and uh, if I say that the variable t or the temperature in this case it depends on x and y so if i for example represent this particular domain which is a 2d domain you can see that the direction x is along the horizontal and the direction y is along the vertical and we are defining the temperature at any particular location x comma y as t which depends on x and y. So the diffusion equation says that partial derivative of time, uh, temperature with respect to x the second de derivative of that plus the second derivative of uh, t with respect to y is equals to zero. So one thing to note here is that Previously, we have been talking about dt over dx or d squared t over dx squared. That is, the equations have all having these complete or the total derivative terms. It only represents that the variable t it only depended on x. And now we are talking about the dependence of t on both x and y. So we can't really say dt over dx because we also have the variable y. So in this case, we, we only talk about what is called as the partial derivatives and this is represented by this delta sign or some, sometimes people also call this partial derivative. So we are saying that the second partial derivative of t with respect to x, the second partial derivative of t with respect to y, when they are added together, that gives me zero. And this is the 2D diffusion equation. Now, the trick to evaluate or discretize these uh, derivative terms or in specific these partial derivative terms, the way in which we do that is we assume that the other dimension or the other variable or the other location is going to remain as it is. So if I'm talking about let's say partial t over partial x where t depends on x and y then I'll assume that the y remains constant when I do this differentiation, when I do this partial differentiation. So we can still use the discretization equation that we derived previously for the first order derivatives or the second order derivatives. We just have to make sure that the variable that we are doing the differentiation with respect to, it remains, we actually do the differentiation with respect to that and the other variable that, that remains constant. So what that means is, so before we go into the part where we discretize these equations, let us look at the mesh first. So when we had a 1D system, we had a 1D domain and what we were doing was, we were saying that a general point was referred as I index and we said that the neighbors are I plus 1 and I minus 1. 
So when we have a 2D system, we again, let us go back to the problem domain, which was a rectangle or a square. So in this case, if I divide that particular domain in few different parts, then again, the general point would, would be called as pi comma j. And if I'm saying that this is the positive x-axis and vertically downwards is the positive y-axis, the reason why I'm putting vertically down is would be very clear soon. Then this particular point here, this would be same as i, but it would be j plus 1. And similarly, if I go up, it would be i comma j minus 1. And if I look at the horizontal neighbors, they would be i plus 1 comma j and the other one would be i minus 1 comma j. The reason why I have taken the y vertically downwards as positive is uh, because of the way MATLAB operates. So when we would be going to MATLAB in next uh, lecture, we would see that in the case of 2D matrix, the top left corner is the first element in that particular matrix and this particular direction is positive in x and this particular direction is positive in y. MATLAB doesn't really have any sort of negative indexing. So the first index starts from 1 comma 1 and then we have 2 comma 1, 3 comma 1 and similarly 1 comma 2, 1 comma 3. So vertically downwards would be, would be taken as positive there. But if you understand the way in which we are going to write these equations, it doesn't really matter which direction you are considering a positive or negative because your programming would be adapted accordingly. So let's go back to the equation here and let's look at the first term which is del square t over del x square. For one moment, let us forget that these are partial derivatives and if we look at this particular point, that is the general point i comma j. And if I wanted to write, let's say d square t over dx square, we write this, if this was a 1d case, we write this as t i plus 1 minus 2 t i plus t i minus 1 divided by h square, where let us say h is equal to delta x. So in this particular case, we are going to do a very similar thing. So you remember that if we are doing this partial derivative with respect to x, then we would keep the y as constant. So we wouldn't consider any changes in the y direction. We only consider the changes in the x direction. And that is why it's called as a partial derivative, because we are ignoring the y variations and we are being partial towards the x direction here. So this particular partial derivative, it's written as very similar to this expression here. So rather than ti plus 1, we write ti plus 1 comma j minus 2 ti comma j plus ti minus 1 comma j divided by delta x squared. And similarly, the another term that is partial derivative of y, the second partial derivative of y, it would be equal to t i j minus 1 minus 2 t i j plus t i j plus 1 divided by delta y square. So there are two kind of problems or there are two kind of schemes in which we can do this iterative procedure to come to the steady state solution. So one of the ways is to march in time or to move forward in time. And that is usually possible when we have a time derivative term. So in those kind of problem, we find or we assume that there is some old solution. And then using that time derivative or using that time marching, we find the new solution. But whenever we are given a equation or a governing equation that is sort of displaying a steady state nature, then the kind of uh, procedure that we adapt was actually displayed in the last lecture where we said that the point i comma j can be calculated every once in a while and the new value that we calculate using its labor would be substituted for future calculations. 
So what I mean to say is, so the original equation was simply the addition of uh, the first term and the second term. So if I add these two terms, I will get, so I'm writing the first term here, which is the partial second order de derivative of uh, t with respect to x. equals to 0. So right now this particular equation it doesn't say anything about whether this is an old value or the new value. So now we are going to talk about how we get a new value in these 2D kind of situations and we are going to take one very simple approximation or simplification here is that the grid is uniform or the mesh is uniform or what that means is that the delta x and the delta y they are equal to each other. In some cases, the uniform grid makes things very easy because you can get certain simplifications as we would be seeing very shortly. But in some cases, these grids may not be very desirable. Let us say you want to resolve some properties near the wall or a boundary. So you would want very fine grid towards there. So what you would want is to have a very fine grid only in that particular section and everywhere else in the domain, you may not want that kind of fine grid because the fine grid takes more time and more computational power. So for now, we are going to stick to this uniform grid simplification so that the delta x, the grid spacing in the x direction, and the delta y, the grid spacing in the y direction, they are equal to each other. And if we say that delta x equals delta y, one beautiful thing happens is that this particular equation it sort of gets rid of these delta x and delta y terms. And if I add these all the terms to get t i j, what we get is that it is 1 by 4 of t i plus 1 comma j plus t i minus 1 comma j plus t i j minus 1 plus t i j plus 1. If you remember if, when we were dealing with the 1D situations, we also saw that the Ti was the average of its neighbors because we only had two neighbors, so it was 1 by 2 Ti minus 1 and Ti plus 1. And it, the same happens in the 2D scenario that the Ti is given as 1 by 4 of the immediate neighbors. It's not counting these northeast, south, uh, northwest, and the southeast and southwest neighbors. It's only considering these four immediate neighbors and the Tij is given as that particular neighborhood average. So the way in which the iterative procedure works here as well is that for we initialize the problem first of all. And the second thing is that we need the boundary conditions. And this way we get a system of uh, t that is defined at let's say a time step of n or you can also write it as t old. And once we apply this discretized version of tij, using this we can get the next or the new value of this temperature field. So if we use, let us say that equation 1, using the equation 1 we can get t new or sometimes it's also called as t n plus 1 and we keep doing this procedure until we get the steady state solution and in some case you can also define an error and you can define an error threshold. So in the next lecture we would be seeing as to how to write this particular uh, form of equations in the math lab. So uh, but before we actually conclude this uh, lecture I want to talk about one set of boundary conditions that we would be using because if you see here we can't really proceed without a proper set of boundary conditions. So in this particular case if I go back to the problem here we would be having a t equals to 0 on three of the faces and t equal to 1 at the top face and these kind of boundary conditions are called as a bridged boundary conditions because they represent a fixed value of the variable at all these faces. 
There are human kind of boundary conditions which represent the flux of the variable at these places, but that is something that uh, we can expand on in later lectures. So, to summarize today's lecture, we have started to look into a two-dimensional system. The system has three boundaries at zero temperature value. The top boundary is at one temperature value. And we saw that the discretized version of the Kamali equation says that we average the, the new value of the temperature at any point inside the domain is the average of its immediate neighbors. So in the next lecture, we would see how we can write a MATLAB code to solve this equation and specifically we would be looking at how we get the solution and the second thing or the more interesting part would be to how to plot the solutions or how to visualize the results. So if you got a good understanding of uh, the first MATLAB tutorial, I highly, highly recommend that you at least give it a try to uh, solve this particular set of equations. One hint is that more or less the entire code would remain unchanged. Only an addition would be there that would be that instead of one loop, because we just have one dimension in the previous example, there would be two form loops that would be used in this particular example because we have the variations in x and in y. I hope that you learned something from this video and stay tuned. The next video would be released very shortly where we'll be looking into the MATLAB part of this particular lecture. And if you haven't already subscribed, I highly recommend that you subscribe so that you can get the notifications for that. Thank you, stay safe and I'll see you in the next video.